Listen to the voices of the advocates. Hello, listeners. Welcome to another episode of Advocates the Podcast. Our guest today is Lord David Panic QC. He is perhaps best known today for acting for Gina Miller, where in September 2019, his articulate and balanced submission persuaded the Supreme Court to hold by 11 to 0 that the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom had unlawfully prorogued Parliament, resulting in Parliament being recalled the next day. His career, however, did not start off too promisingly. He joined Lord Leicester at the Privy Council in a case challenging the constitutionality of the death penalty in Singapore. He lost. The death penalty was upheld. His client was hanged. He says he could only do better after that. And he certainly did. In a career now spanning over four decades, Lord Panic had argued cases and assisted in the development of the law in areas such as administrative and public law, civil liberties and human rights, media and entertainment, EU and competition law. Listeners will present to you Lord David Panic, QC. Lord Panic, thank you very much for being with us here on Advocates, the podcast. I'd like to begin by asking you about your parents and your family and your life in Romford before you went to school. Okay, well, it's a great pleasure to be talking to you. Thank you for inviting me. My heritage is that my great grandparents were Jewish refugees from Poland, from Russia. They came to this country, England. They saw it as a haven from persecution. And I would imagine, I didn't know them, that they would be astonished that their great grandson was an advocate. And I'm very proud of that heritage. My parents believe that education was of primary importance. I was actually brought up near Romford in Ilford in Essex. My father worked in Romford. He had a shoe shop. And I remember very well him telling me stories of his customers. He was not the best salesman. He would say to the customers, well, if you don't like them, don't have them. That was his, <laughs> uh, his, uh, his principle. My mother was a school secretary and she was the dominant force in our family. Very ambitious for me and for my sister. So that was my upbringing. I was very fortunate that uh, I won a scholarship to Bancroft School in Woodford Green at the age of 11. And I had a wonderful op- education there, magnificent opportunities. I was interested to read that you had decided by the time you were 16 that you were to be a barrister. How did you arrive at that? If that is true, of course. <laughs> Well, it is true. I mean, I, I was always interested in debating at school. I liked the idea of arguing, of presenting cases. I was good at debating at school. I remember very well going, may have been at the age of 15 or 16, to watch a case at the Old Bailey, the Central Criminal Court in London, and being very struck by the formality of the occasion, the drama and uh, the excitement, the uncertainty, what was going to happen, that enthralled me. I haven't myself ever practiced criminal law. I've never argued a case in front of a jury, although I have sat as a deputy judge in criminal cases with juries, but I never actually argued the case. But that was what enthralled me and what led me to think that this would be a good thing to do. And I didn't know it at the age of 16, but my principle now is the principle that Cicero, great Roman advocate, said, he explained, there is no more excellent thing than the power by means of advocacy to direct a tribunal wherever the speaker wishes or divert them from whatever he wishes. Well, <laughs> you know, one hopes, <laughs> one aspires, yeah. but that's One, one could do. Or the other Roman, the writer on advocacy, Quintilian, described oratory as, quote, the best gift of the gods to man. You know, he puts it in a very elevated way, but it is something quite remarkable. You stand up, and you speak, and you hope to influence people in the direction that you're, you're suggesting. Razlan? To follow up on that, At 16 years old, you decided to 
go to the old Bailey to watch a criminal trial. I mean, I mean, like 16, I wanted to do a lot of things, but going to the old Bailey, watching a criminal <laughs> trial, is not exactly top of my list. What sort of 16-year-old were you? You must have been quite precocious. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I take the Fifth Amendment. I don't want to incriminate my, myself. <laughs> You know, I did do normal things. I also went to football matches. You know, I went to the cinema with girlfriends and all, all that sort of things. I don't want to portray myself as some sort of freak from the planet advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> don't want to do that. I was thinking at the age of 16, people would be my day. People would be thinking, well, what subject am I going to do at university? Because you had to apply. At the age of 17, you applied for your course. So we were already being encouraged in my school to think about such things. And it was the school holidays. You know, there's only so many days that you can lie in bed, only so many days you can play football with your friends. So <laughs> that's what I did. But I don't want to convey the impression that I was some sort of obsessive. You know, you sometimes read about these children at the age of four They've already got their maths A level. You know, I wasn't like that. <laughs> oh, you know, fairly normal. But I was interested. I was interested in legal process. Yeah, absolutely. From there, you went on to Hartford College after school in Oxford, and you read law there, did you? Yeah, I read law. I had this remarkable tutor, Roy Stewart, now sadly deceased, who was extraordinary. He's one of these old fashioned tutors who wrote very, very little and devoted himself to uh, encouraging, inspiring his law students. He was a pivotal figure in my legal education and encouraged me very much. And I was fortunate I did well there. And that confirmed my belief that a legal career as a barrister was what I should pursue. Can I ask, I mean, and this is having spoken to Jonathan Crow, you know, and, and Lord Sumption a couple of weeks ago, both of them did history at Magdalen and then converted to law after. Any regrets about that? Would you like to have done an, another degree? Well, I think possibly if I had my time again, I might say to myself, if you're going to practice law for the whole of your professional life, might be a good idea to do something else before you start, you know, either history or PPE, politics, philosophy, economics, something like that. But it was actually an interesting course in Oxford. The jurisprudence course is not just hardcore law. It does encourage you to think about law. There is historical analysis involved, philosophy of the law, economics of the law. So it was a broad course. So I, I don't really have any regrets. But when students ask me, we're thinking of being a barrister, do we have to do a law degree? My answer is no, absolutely not. And you're right, there are many examples, many examples. Lord Denning, of course, was a maths scholar before he became a barrister. And one of the most eminent judges of my time, Lord Bridge, didn't go to university at all. In his days, you could just go straight to the bar. Well, we've established within eight minutes of the interview, and I think that's a record, that advocacy was clearly what you intended to do. Um, so, so let's just get straight to I, that. I don't mess around. I think I'm no, known you don't. for making yes. brief submissions. I think yes. if you can't persuade people in a short period of time with the essence of the argument, you're not going to persuade them by going on and on and on. Now, that's the principle that I... Adopt. I mean, there's a famous case where an advocate, defence advocate, and he, was, he was the prosecution, that's right, he was the prosecution counsel in a case, and he stood up in his closing submissions to the jury, and he said, well, he did it, didn't he? <laughs> that, that was it. <laughs> and that was enough. Let's turn now to your route to the bar. How did you go from, in those days, from university, having done the bar, what was your route to the bar in London? Well, in those days, it was all very different. You didn't make formal applications as you do now to different sets of chambers for pupillage. You relied through a central system, which is transparent, uh, it's fair, gives opportunities to people who have no connections. In my day, and we're talking, what, late 1970s, I 
finished my first degree at Oxford 1977. I then did a BCL, Bachelor of Civil Law, for another year, 1978. And that's when I was applying for the bar. And I was very fortunate. At the end of 1978, I was elected to All Souls College. I won a, a what's called a prize fellowship. They elect each year from all different subjects, two people, two people in total. And you get a seven-year fellowship. And you have a choice. Either you can be an academic or you can follow a professional career. And they knew I was planning to be a barrister. There's no problem with that. And the advantage of that was that I made connections. And one of the connections I made there, another fellow, was a barrister about seven, ten years older than me called Michael Hart. And he was already a distinguished chancery junior. He dealt with trusts and tax and matters of that sort, chancery law. And I didn't know anything really about the bar other than going to the Old Bailey. And I thought, well, you know, maybe he will take me as his pupil. And he agreed to do so. Sadly, he's now dead. He died at a very young age, I think late 50s, after becoming a high court judge. And he said, yes, you can come as my pupil. So I started in pupillage with him, must have been September 1979. And I went and I sat with him. And he was a lovely man, but it was incredibly boring, incredibly. I mean, what the work was, was by and large drafting variations to trust for very wealthy people so they could become even more wealthy. <laughs> he went to court maybe once or twice a term. I didn't like that at all. I got really, really bored. And I was explaining this because I used to go to All Souls at the weekends. And I explained this to another fellow, much older fellow, called Max Beloff, who was a very distinguished historian, political theorist. And he said, well, if you find that boring, you should speak to my son. My son is Michael Beloff. Of course, I'd heard of Michael Beloff, very distinguished barrister, now retired. And you should speak to him because I'm sure he'd love to have you as his pupil. So I, I contacted him and he said, yes, I was very, very fortunate. He said, yes, you come as my pupil. So I said, thank you to Michael Hart. He understood perfectly. And I joined Michael Beloff. And this was heaven because Michael Beloff was then the leading junior dealing with the emerging field of public law, judicial reviews, human rights before the Human Rights Act. Now, he would do cases in the European Court of Human Rights. He would do cases in immigration tribunals. And this was fantastic. It was so stimulating. I remember when I was his pupil, he would bring me into cases. One of his cases was for the now dead Scientologist leader, L. Ron Hubbard. And uh, Mr. Hubbard, very controversial figure, would have these rows with the Home Office. And in this case, Mr. Hubbard wanted to come to England to visit his followers. And the Home Office said, well, Mr. Hubbard must turn up at the Los Angeles consulate to make the application in person. And our instructions were, well, he can't do that. He won't turn up. And the Home Office uh, replied, well, the reason he won't turn up is because we think he's dead. And Michael Beloff thought <laughs> about this and he made the application for a formal decision, and it was turned down. No, he's dead. And we went to the High Court. We had a two-day hearing before Mr. Justice Harry Wolf, where Michael Beloff's ingenious argument amounted to this. We don't accept that he's dead, but if he were, there would be no harm in granting the uh, immigration clearance because he wouldn't be able to use it in any event. <laughs> and Justice Wolf was having none of that. And the application dismissed, and <laughs> we appealed to the Court of Appeal. Uh, but uh, just before the hearing, just before the hearing, it was announced by the Scientologists in LA that sadly Mr. Hubbard had now died and his ashes had been, had been scattered. I mean, this was wonderful stuff. I, re I, I, I was enthralled. Could I ask a bit more, Michael Belloff? Because one of our guests in our previous episode, Delvinder Singh, SC, the leading advocate in Singapore, said he juniored Michael Beloff in one case. 
And he said, Michael Veloz turns up with three lines of notes on an A4 paper and then proceeded to do the most wonderful cross-examination for several hours based on that three lines. Did he bequeath that to you, Lord Panic? No, <laughs> no, absolutely not. I mean, I'm, I'm sure that is a true story. I sat behind him in many, many cases, and he was an advocate of genius in his ability to uh, weave a web that would capture the judge or the witness. He was an incredibly skillful advocate, articulate, witty, inventive, and I learned an enormous amount from him. I mean, when I was his pupil, he would do a full day in court. He'd then have a couple of conferences after court, and I would go home exhausted. I mean, I hadn't done anything other than listen, but he would go off and run a half marathon. He was the Observer newspaper's legal correspondent, so he'd produce copy for the weekend. He was an incredibly talented, formidable, uh, and kind man, and still a very good friend of mine. He, he left the bar. I spoke at his retirement party when he left the bar to become the president of Trinity College, Oxford. And within a week, he was back arguing cases and carrying out his functions as president of Trinity College, Oxford. <laughs> In terms of preparing for cases, then, your approach will be slightly different from Michael Belloff's. Oh, yeah. My approach is I, I make a lot of notes. You know, I did a case recently in the High Court. I must have had 200 pages of notes. This was just legal argument. There weren't any witnesses. But, you know, I like to have in front of me the fruits of my researches and thoughts. I mean, obviously, I don't read it out, but I, I like to have it there, I could never do what you describe Michael Belloff as, as having done. And I'm, you know, you're right, that, you would do that. But those notes were the consequence of a great deal of work and thought. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't one of these people, you know, when I started, sometimes you'd see a counsel on the other side. You know, I was just a junior, but I would see counsel on, on the other side. I was being led. And the counsel, he'd have his papers and he'd say, my lord, I appear for Mr. Jeffrey Smith. You know, <laughs> as he's opening his brief in the courtroom, it just it was a revelation who he was acting for. Michael was never like that. He did enormous, enormous amounts of work. Enormous amounts of work. Can I ask the other early influences you had in Chambers, apart from Michael Belloff? Well, the other one was Anthony Lester now sadly deceased, Lord Leicester of, of Hearn Hill, I arrived at what was then Two Hair Court in the temple, where now Blackstone Chambers was removed, Two Hair Court. And I arrived there to join Michael, and it must have been about March 1980. And in the first week, I met on the stairs Anthony Lester, and he said to me, famous words, he said, I've got an interesting case in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Would you like to do a couple of days' work researching some aspects for me. And I was very keen. I said, yes, I'd be you know, honoured. I'd be delighted. He said, great. And three months later, I was his second junior in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council in the great case of Ong R. Chuan. And I'd done a mass of work. And this was my first case in court about the death penalty. Mr. Ong R. Chuan had the misfortune to be convicted in Singapore of trafficking in hard drugs. And he received the mandatory sentence of death. And the issue in the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council was whether the mandatory nature of the death penalty was uh, inconsistent with the Singapore Constitution, which guaranteed due process of law, equal protection of the laws. And my job was to look for uh, cases constitutional law cases which supported the proposition that you can't have a mandatory death penalty. You've got to look at the particular circumstances of the case to assess whether, on the facts, this defendant deserves this penalty. And I did 
enormous amounts of work. I found cases in the United States which supported that proposition, cases in India as well, in the Indian Supreme Court. You'll remember, you know, there's a wealth of jurisprudence relating to the death penalty. Who was the famous judge who would often, Krishna Iyer? Am I thinking of? And other judges who would pronounce on these issues and, and cases from other jurisdictions as well. So I did an enormous amount of work and we went to the Judicial Committee and unfortunately the presiding judge was Lord Diplock. And Lord Diplock was not sympathetic. I mean, he said to Anthony Lester early in the proceedings, was this point taken in the courts below? To which the answer was no. And Diplock said, well, why should I hear this point? You know, we don't have the views of the lower courts. <laughs> Anthony Lester said, because Otherwise, our client's going to be executed. <laughs> and Diplock said, well, the point can be taken in another case. Uh, and he said, it's not much comfort to, to my client. And they adjourned. And one of the panel members was Lord Scarman. And I think behind the scenes, Scarman must have persuaded Diplock that we should be heard. So they came back in. In those days, the Privy Council sat in number one Downing Street next to the Prime Minister's residence. And they said, well, we'll hear you, we'll hear you. But they weren't sympathetic and we, we lost. Mr. Ong Ah Chuan was hanged. And I have the distinction, if it be a distinction, of being able to say that my first client received the death penalty. And I always say to my clients that you can only get better after that starts. You can't go, <laughs> can't go any further down. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Anthony was an, an enormous influence, and he was an enormous influence because in those days, I mean, it's all changed partly because of him, but in those days, if you argued by reference to judgments in foreign jurisdictions, the opposing counsel would say something like, Mr. Lester invites the court to take a cook's tour around the world, and I respectfully invite your lordship to remain uh, in this jurisdiction. I mean, people say that sort of thing. And he would raise arguments about proportionality and human rights. And in those days, he, he didn't do that. And, and so he was subjected to ridicule. And, uh, but he persisted. And partly because of him, the whole culture of public law has changed. I mean, what was then esoteric is now obvious and standard that, of course, you argue about the judgments of foreign courts in public law cases. Of course, you refer to human rights considerations and proportionality. All of that is standard. So he had an enormous influence on me. He was, he, he was someone with a very, very thick skin in court, but a man of great sensitivity outside a court. And he needed a thick skin in order to progress the way in which public law cases were developed. So he was the other great influence, the two of them, uh, Peloff and Lester. And I was very, very fortunate. I think Anthony Lester did a, a couple of cases out here in Malaysia as well, and very, very highly regarded uh, here. Can I ask now about the young David Panic? You're in Blackstone Chambers, as it became later. How did the work start to come in? What type of work started to come in? And how did your career develop from after pupillage? Yeah, well, like anybody's career as a barrister, it's a story of accidents and good fortune, being in the right place at the right time. I mean, the, the early 1980s was really the growth of public law in the United Kingdom. So I was in the right place, two hair court, Blackstone Chambers, at the right time. There were judicial reviews, there was immigration law, discrimination cases. I did a lot of early discrimination cases, sex discrimination, race discrimination. And you know, if you do those cases, they get reported either in the newspapers or in the law reports. And then solicitors think that you're the right person. You know about this area of the law. So more work comes your way. And then I would write newspaper articles that would show people I knew something about these areas. And there was not a great deal of competition in those days because this was a burgeoning, a growing area of law. 
absolutely crucial to my development in this area was that in about 1985, I'd been in practice for five years doing cases on my own and being the junior to Anthony or, or Michael in many, many other cases which got reported. I was put on the panel of the government advocates. And of course, there was an inexhaustible supply of government work. And the way it would work in those days was quite extraordinary. I mean, there was the Treasury junior who would do the civil cases for the government. And that was John Laws around that time, later distinguished Court of Appeal judge, sadly died last year. He was the Treasury junior and he would do the judicial reviews in the High Court, Court of Appeal, Appellate Committee. And I was led by him in, in many cases. But there were dozens of cases and he couldn't do them all. And the system was a bizarre system that each evening at about 3.30, 4 p.m., his clerks would recognize that he was due to be in four or five different courts the next day, High Court, Court of Appeal, Appellate Committee. And they realized he couldn't do them all. So they would ring round the clerks to the others on the panel. I was on the panel. And they would say, is Mr. Panic available to do a case in the Court of Appeal tomorrow? My clerks would say yes, and I would get the brief, say, you know, half past four or five o'clock, you're in the Court of Appeal tomorrow, you're before the Master of the Rolls, Sir John Donaldson, you're for the Commissioners of Customs and Excise, and it's the VAT appeal. Now, I don't know anything about VAT. <laughs> so I get the brief, and I start to open it, and I look for the instructions, I look for an opinion, it might give me some idea <laughs> what this is all about. <laughs> and the instructions would say, and be instructions to John Laws, because he was instructed to say, Council will recall advising in conference on this very important case. And he will recall just how important this is to HM Treasury. And Council is instructed to put all the arguments that you mentioned in conference. Well, great. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. you know, I, I, I slightly exaggerate, but it was, uh, well, it had two characteristics. It was absolutely terrifying. But it was an enormously educative experience because if you could do that, if you could prepare overnight a difficult case in the Court of Appeal and get away with it, you know, know how to present the best points and deal with the difficult points, then you could do anything. And that was enormously valuable as training in advocacy. And you'd have the advantage also in many other cases you would listen to see how John Laws would put the cases. So I got a lot of work from the Treasury, very interesting cases, enormously interesting cases. And because I was in those cases, because my name was in the law reports, I would then get private client work that would come to me as well because I was on the panel, but there was no exclusive arrangement. John Laws only did the government work, but if you're on the panel, you didn't have to. It's all changed because it was unsustainable. And now you still have a panel, but the work is allocated sensibly to each member of the panel. And the main Treasury devil, now Sir James Eady, will know what his diary is going to be. It's far more methodical and all the better for it. And of course, this was in the days before skeleton arguments. Skeleton arguments hadn't yet arrived. So it's a bit easier now, and it, it makes it necessary because cases are thought about in the, the skeleton argument phase, you don't wait until a couple of days before the hearing to work out your arguments. So obviously some very late nights. Can I ask about the advocacy? You, you spoke about watching John Laws and, on his feet. And can I ask whether you were influenced just in terms of advocacy itself, the way people articulate your arguments in court, that skill. Did anyone influence you in any particular way? You look at them and say, yeah, I'd like to do it like that. Well, yeah, I mean, I would also mention Sir Sidney Kentridge, very, very distinguished advocate who I had the pleasure of appearing against. I never did a case with him, but I appeared against him on several occasions. And he was a remarkable advocate. I mean, he, he was South African. He'd had a very distinguished career at the South African bar and then had come to England and had very speedily be recognized for the skillful advocate that he was. 
And I remember doing one case against him. It was as if the judge was ushered into the back seat of a luxurious sedan car and Sir Sidney would just drive him. The judge would sit back and relax and Sir Sidney would drive him to the appropriate destination, <laughs> pointing out <laughs> points of interest along the way. And the judge would simply nod in appreciation of what he was saying. I mean, he was a remarkable advocate. One case I did against Sir Sidney was in the Supreme Court. And the case occurred on Sir Sidney's 90th birthday. And he was only appearing for an intervener. This was a case about legal professional privilege. And he was appearing for the Law Society and the Bar Council. But, you know, if on my 90th birthday, I am able to stand up and eat my breakfast, I shall be very, very happy. Man <laughs> indeed. But he was able to present his arguments very, 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 very coherently and with great eloquence, great force. I remember he spoke, he must have been 95 by this time, he spoke at the retirement event in the Supreme Court for Lord Mance which must have been three or four years ago. And Sir Sidney brought the house down. He began his address to the court by saying, I was a great honour to appear in your Lordship's court on the occasion of Lord Mance's retirement. At what appears to me, said Sir Sidney, to be a ridiculously young age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking up this reference here. There was a 19th century advocate called James Scarlett, later Lord Abinger. And it was said of him that, I quote, this was said by um, John Lord Campbell in The Lives of the Lord Chancellors. He, quote, had invented a machine by the secret use of which in court he could always make the head of a judge nod assent to his propositions, unquote. My goodness. Well, that's, My goodness. Sidney. that's, right. that's Sidney. Right. That's brilliant quote. <laughs> Remarkable um, talent. Let me now pivot very quickly and just deal with another aspect of your career, which is, I mean, you're a prolific author, written, I think, six books. I, I think the ones that are most famous and have been enjoyed the world over, certainly by us, advocates and judges, how did you come to think of doing those two books? What planted the seed? Well, as I went through my professional life, I would collect anecdotes, stories about advocates and judges, some of which I've mentioned to you today. And I thought there's very little written on judges and even less written on the subject of advocates. And I thought the entertaining for me to collect these ideas. And Judges was written a long, long time ago. It was written at a time when the judiciary in England was still very historic in its attitudes and its behaviour. It's changed remarkably in the last 20 or 30 years. And I would also, since after 1992, till last year, I wrote a fortnightly column on the law in the Times. So many of the thoughts that are collected in these books are based on work that I've done for these fortnightly columns. And I enjoyed it. You see, the problem with being a barrister is that your task is to speak on behalf of your client. You're not expressing your views. You are paid to be argumentative, inquisitive, questioning, persuasive, eloquent, apologetic on behalf of the client, whoever they might be, whether you admire them, whether you despise them, you're speaking your voice for somebody else. And I like the idea that I also have my own voice and I don't use my own. Those are not my opinions when I'm speaking in courts. They're the position I'm paid to adopt. So I like the idea of having another string to my bow in which I could express my private views. You mentioned judges and advocates. 
can I commend to you, this is an advertising break mm -hmm. in the session, <laughs> can I mention to you the more recent, I have to move my car. And I have to move my car is a collection of Times newspaper articles. And the reason for the title, I have to move my car, is because in a federal court of appeals case in the United States in the 1970s, I think, the um, miserable advocate stood up before the judge and said, Your Honor, my submissions today will not take very long because I have to move my car by five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> so I enjoy writing. I'm at the moment preparing some lectures which will be published. I'm giving this year the Hamlin Lectures in London. The first Hamlin lecturer in 1946 was Lord Denning. And since then, been uh, lectures on a wide variety of legal subjects. And uh, I've been invited this year. I hope we can all meet in person and not just virtually in November on the subject of advocacy. So that's what I'm doing. The problem with speaking on that subject is the risk that what you say may be wholly unpersuasive, but I will do my best. We look forward to seeing that published, absolutely. Obviously, you are a man who, who enjoys humour because the subtitle to your book, your latest book, is Tales of Unpersuasive Advocates and Injudicious Judges. But could I ask you, as an advocate, do you find humour useful? And how do you successfully employ it in, in trials or in your cases? Well, the answer to your question is I, I do enjoy humour, but I avoid it in my submissions because there's a great danger that your attempt at jokes in court will fall flat. There's a famous case in the United States Supreme Court, Roe and Wade, the abortion case, where the counsel for the states in Texas stood up and he began his submissions and he was appearing against two female advocates. And he said something like, when a man has an argument with two beautiful women, he's going to lose. Something like that. And it's a joke, a pathetic joke, yeah. but it fell completely flat. There was stunned silence at just how inappropriate this was. In, particularly given the nature of the proceedings. So I follow the approach that it's extremely unwise. It was Mr. J. Floyd, counsel for the state of Texas. I adopt the approach that you leave the jokes to the judges. Let them make the jokes. And when they make the jokes, you laugh riotously. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> what I commend to other lawyers. There are some people who can do this. Michael Belloff was very, very good at, at laughing the uh, other side's case out of court. But I can't do it. I don't try to do it. I know my limitations. I'm just looking up here the reference. Yes, it's in the Guide for Counsel in Cases to be Argued Before the Supreme Court of the United States. Their formal guide says this, attempts at humour usually fall flat. <laughs> That's a principle I, I adopt. There's also, there's a reference in a book about Abraham Lincoln, not just a very distinguished president, but before he became president of the United States, very distinguished advocate. And the story is he's acting for a defendant in a civil case. And he, he stands to address the jury. He slowly picks up the plaintiff's petition, he scrutinises it closely, and he indulges in a long, loud laugh, accompanied by the most wonderfully grotesque facial expression. The judge and jury join in, and the jury make a very small award of damages uh, to the plaintiff. Well, <laughs> I, I couldn't do that. I really, I really couldn't. So I laugh when judges make jokes. I remember I once made an illusion, a sort of joke, 
I was doing a case in the European Court of Human Rights for the British government. And it was just after there'd been the ice dance championships of the world. And the British ice dancers, who were called Torville and Dean, had triumphed. They were the world champions. And I can't remember why, but I said, I said, you know, this case is a bit like Torville and Dean. And my submissions were, were being translated into the languages of the court. And it was perfectly obvious that those listening didn't have the faintest idea <laughs> what I was talking about. They probably thought Torval and Dean was some case like Donahue and Stevenson, <laughs> or, you know, something of that, that nature. So I, I just don't do that. I play it straight in court, play it very straight. It's a straight man. Okay. Coming now to your appointment as Silk, um, you took Silk at th the age of 36, which is young by any standards. What accounted for that, do you think? Well, I'd done a lot of high-profile cases, and the advantage of doing cases for the government being on the panel was, as I'd explained, you, you would argue the cases. Although you were a junior, you would argue the cases, and you'd be exposed in the Court of Appeal I did cases in the appellate committee as a, as, as a junior. And so, therefore, I had the opportunity to apply for Silk younger than my contemporaries who hadn't had those advantages, who hadn't had that experience. And so the judges knew me. Again, in those days, it was the old system. The, the system was you would apply and the Lord Chancellor would take soundings and the people from whom he took soundings were people who knew me because they'd seen me in court. Of course, the system, much better system now, is there's a formal appointments commission. You, you make your application. But in those days, it was on the basis of where you known. So he would consult and people say, oh, yeah, yeah, I had young panic. He appeared in the Court of Appeal before me last week. He did all right. So that was fine. So I was appointed at the age of 36. And I was ready because I had a lot of experience arguing cases and I was keen to do more cases on my own. You know, I'd had the training, sitting behind people, sometimes enjoyable, you know, behind Anthony Lester, Michael Beloff, sometimes frustrating. I remember a case, I won't say who the leading counsel was, but I was doing a case in the appellate committee and my leader was totally useless, totally useless. He didn't know the answer to a pretty basic question about the case. So I wrote a note and I handed him the note. And he, he very theatrically paused. My very learned junior, my lords, is inviting me to repeat myself. <laughs> <laughs> and they all laughed, laughed at him. And Lord Muskell, I think it was, said, well, Mr. So-and-so, when I was at the bar, I was handed a note by my junior. And I read it and it simply said, Sit down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's a classic story. So it was, you know, there were occasions where it was a frustrating experience. I, I took the view, either accurately or arrogantly, but it's my view, that I could do this job, you know, not as well as Michael Belloff, Anthony Lester, because I needed years of experience, but I could do as well as the standard. And therefore, I was ready. And the Lord Chancellor agreed, and, and I was appointed. I was very pleased. And was your approach after you took Silk, was your approach to cases different than as a junior? And if so, how? Just get paid more. But otherwise, no, it was entirely the same. I would prepare the cases. I mean, it's different if you're a junior because you're preparing it for somebody else. And some leaders would just want to discuss it with you and get ideas. Some would want a script. You know, they want you to do the submissions May it please your lordships, I appear for the appellant. You'd write it all out for them. So, you know, if you're doing it for yourself, your method of preparation is inevitably different from the way in which you prepare for your leader. But by and large, no. And as I say, by that stage, I was most, no, not most, a large part of my work was arguing cases myself anyway. Right. Even though you became a silk, you continued to sort of prepare your submissions, write your submissions all on your own? Yeah, and, and often in the cases before I became a QC, I would have junior counsel working with me, assisting me. So I was already 
used to the idea of working with people. And of course, I had pupils as a junior council. And so when I became a QC, the relationship with the junior council was not very different from the relationship with the pupil. Okay. You've argued some incredibly high profile cases. Just two I want to touch on, or one case and one client. And the case is Spycatcher. You were involved in that. And I was just wondering what it was like. I think that was 85, so fairly young in your career. What was it like coming up against the system? Well, I mean, it was a sensational case. I mean, this is a case where former MI5 agent uh, spills the beans and the government gets offended, the British government, and they go for injunctions all around the world to stop publication. And the inevitable consequence of the legal action is to create massive worldwide publicity for this book, which was a load of rubbish. I mean, it really was (laughs) the most atrocious drivel. And yet it became a worldwide bestseller. And I was Anthony Lester's junior for the Sunday Times. And the Sunday Times had bought the serialization rights. And the case went on for years. I mean, it went on and on and on. I mean, we appeared at least three times in the appellate committee. It was the injunction proceeding. I mean, that was the most extraordinary. The original was 1987, I think it started, the attempt by the government to get an injunction. And this went all the way to the appellate committee. And it was very, very finely balanced. And it was a rare case in which they didn't hand down their written judgments. Instead, we were summoned to the chamber of the House of Lords. And each of the five stood up in turn to say whether they allowed the appeal, and it was our appeal, or whether they dismissed the appeal. And we didn't know until they spoke whether the injunction would be granted. And the first to stand up was Lord Bridge, the presiding judge. And he said, I will allow this appeal for reasons to be given. So, whoa! Well, except we couldn't because we were sitting in at the bar (laughs) of the house. It was was like, yes! And then the second one, Lord Templeman, I dismissed the appeal. And Lord Ackner dismissed the appeal. So we're 2-1 down. Brandon dismissed the appeal. So we lose. And then Oliver allowed the appeal. So we lost 3-2. And the next day, the Daily Mirror newspaper had pictures of the three who'd found against us on their front page, upside down, with the headline, You Fools. So it it excited a great deal of interest. Then the case went on. We then, there was a claim for damages and a permanent injunction that went all the way to the appellate committee. There were contempt proceedings because there'd been an original injunction against the Guardian newspaper which the Sunday Times had defied. So they were contempt proceedings. Can you, are you in contempt if you breach an order against somebody else? And the um, appellate committee said yes, in certain circumstances. So there were those. Then, then there were the Strasbourg proceedings. So we had a case in the European Court of Human Rights, which we won. Then, because Rupert Murdoch had bought the rights, he decided that he wanted to publish extracts, not just in the Sunday Times, but in his paper that he owned, he then owned, the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. So Anthony Lester and I travelled to Hong Kong. I I couldn't be in the case because I wasn't admitted. I was still a junior. But he argued the case in, in Hong Kong, and I went with him to assist him in the High Court and in the Court of Appeal of Hong Kong. So that was a great experience. So an amazing case. But enormous folly. I mean, it just shows if you bring legal proceedings, you might win the case, but you damage your interests. And Margaret Thatcher was so obsessed with this matter that she pursued it and pursued it. She had many qualities, many admirable qualities. But this, I don't think, was one of her triumphs. But it was enormously enjoyable for me. But now, uh, the next question is about a client. and. Obviously, our, our listeners are going to ask us about this. Lady Diana was your client. Yes. I, I yes. What was she like? Yes. What was, did you get to meet her? And well, if you did, what was she like as a client? I did get to meet her. I mean, the case was that 
she was being sued in an employment tribunal. She had dismissed someone who had been a royal servant. And I was instructed on her behalf and I went to Kensington Palace and I met her. Like everybody else, I fell in love with her. She was a very fragile, sensitive individual. Obviously, I can't speak about the details of the case, but it was settled. And this woman who'd worked for her was threatening to say all sorts of things, some of which may have been true, some of which may have been untrue or exaggerated, a bit like Harry and Meghan. (laughs) And so we, we reached a settlement at the door of the court. But I did meet her. She wrote me a lovely thank you letter which I have on my wall in chambers. Dear David, thank you so underlined three times much for <laughs> your invaluable guidance and support. Best wishes, Diana. Whoa. <laughs> it's, great. It's, a great, it's a great memory. Yes, indeed. Yeah, indeed. Great. Okay, I'm going to have to turn to more mundane matters now. Sorry, before I do that, Razlan got something too. Yeah. Just to follow up on that, because you did a huge variety of work. Jopal just mentioned two. I mean, you did Debbie Purdy, the assisted suicide case. You argued the European Court of Human Rights to say that sexual orientation of your client is not a basis for, for lawful dismissal. You did From Camelot the armed Pierre. forces. Yeah, from, from the armed forces, forces. correct. You, yeah, you well, did that, that, I'm very proud of that. I mean, that was a, an extraordinary case where the British armed forces would dismiss anyone whose sexual orientation was gay. Whether or not they'd done anything, they were just dismissed. And the European Court of Human Rights said that was unacceptable. And I'm very proud of that. Oh, yeah, of of course. And, and, you know, you also represented, say, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia on the torture case as well. But my question is this. How do you decide to take on a case? I mean, I know in England we have the cat rank rule and all that. You are who you are now when the brief comes to you, a potential brief, do you actually weigh some issues that, you know, this is interesting, I'll, I'll do it, or, or you just reject the case because, you know, you've, you've done issues like this before? Well, nowadays, I tend to specialise in appellate advocacy. I rarely do trial work. I can't remember the last time I cross-examined somebody. You mentioned Jonathan Crow. I did a case against him in the Supreme Court in early 2020, and it was in the area of trusts, charity law, which is not an area I I specialise in, far from it, but I was asked to do it, and it's a very interesting case, and it's a wonderful opportunity to do cases in the Supreme Court. So I do a whole range of appellate advocacy work. I've done in the last year cases, as I say, on trusts in the Supreme Court, employment law, criminal law, human rights law immigration law, all sorts, foreign relations law, all sorts of, of areas. And I tend to do things if they're interesting, and because like everybody else, I have to pay the bills, lucrative. But what I don't do, what I don't do is breach the cab rank rule, by which I mean I do not turn down clients because I disapprove of them or I find them objectionable. I mean, I, I argue cases if they're in my area or if they're appellate advocacy, you know, I can I can argue the case in the Supreme Court, uh, irrespective of the merits or lack of merits of the client. And I think that's absolutely fundamental that we maintain that principle that there is a body of advocates who will articulate the case of anyone, uh, because otherwise you are associated with your client. I don't want to be associated with my. I want to be understood to be their advocate, whether or not I approve or disapprove of them. I know you said you last time you cross-examined someone you can't remember, but let's try and dial that clock back. How did you approach your cross-examinations in those days? Well, it's a long time ago. I mean, I did a lot of cross-examinations when I was doing discrimination cases, but I have no particular skill in that area. It's I'm, I'm much more of a an advocate who argues points of of law. I mean, cross-examination I found much more difficult, not least because 
you can prepare for a legal argument. You can work out by reference to the facts, by reference to the authorities, what lines to pursue, what defense you have to adopt because of a, an angle that's going to come at you. Cross-examination is much, much more difficult. I mean, people can say anything. You've got no control. You're out of control. I claim no great skills in that area, and I leave it to other people, people who know what they're doing. It's a very, very different skill that people adopt and require. So then let's pivot then to your strength, that appellate advocacy. And I mean, I, I'm sure I speak for Razlan and, and Michelle. I mean, I, I watch wrapped your argument in Gina Miller oh, all God, the way across this side of the world. I mean, it was a uh, fascinating viewing. Well, it's extraordinary just how many people in different jurisdictions watch that case. I mean, I had people from all over the world who said, and the most extraordinary thing about that case, I think, is just how it's attracted such attention in not just in England, but around the world. And I think it was of enormous value to the legal system because people saw that this highly contentious political issue was being argued, the legal aspects of it, were being argued in a structured, coherent, reasonable way on both sides. People were putting forward arguments and responding in a courteous manner before a tribunal that listened, that asked questions, and then gave a reasoned judgment. And we all know that this is very rare in politics. I mean, in politics, you shout at each other. You don't respond to the arguments put by the other side. You insult them. It's not every politician, but this is a tendency that we regrettably have seen throughout the world. So I think that one of the reasons why people were so engrossed by these proceedings was that this was a debate on fundamentally important legal issues, but conducted in a proper manner. And I think it's a wonderful thing. In fact, Lord Banning, you might be interested to know, Miller, in fact, is a relevant precedent to matters which is currently going on in Malaysia pertaining to our own constitution, actually. I'm very interested in it. It's been cited all over the place. Yeah. If we get a, re a reported decision, we'll send that, we'll email that across to you. Yeah, please, I'd be very interested. I'd be very interested. I mean, it's a fundamental issue. I mean, the issue is certainly Miller number two, which I think you're talking about, the prorogation case. Yes, yes, Who is in right. control? Who is in charge? Is it Parliament or, or is it the executive? Is it the government? And the Supreme Court, I think rightly, concluded that it can't be right that the Prime Minister can dispose of Parliament, prorogue, suspend Parliament at a crucial time for six weeks, at least without presenting a justification. And the government's difficulty in that case was that they produced no explanation as to why it was appropriate to have a six-week prorogation. So fascinating case. I must say it's the only case I've ever done that has led to me being approached in a sandwich shop uh, by someone I didn't know who wanted a selfie of them with me. <laughs> the only time. Never happened before. And I think it's unlikely to happen again. <laughs> okay, I, we're, yeah, we're running short of time, and I, and I do want to get this in. Um, I want to use Gina Miller as an example of an appeal that Lord David Panic has argued. So how did you approach it? How do you work out what you're going to say and why? Well, it wasn't a usual case. This case was heard, I think, in September 2019. And after Boris Johnson became Prime Minister earlier that summer, he'd made it clear that he might prorogue Parliament. So we'd started to think, Gina Miller had instructed me, we'd started to think about legal proceedings. But nothing had been announced, and therefore we couldn't do anything. And I was on holiday. I, In August 2019, my family and I, my children, my wife and I, had gone on safari. We were in Botswana. And the telephone connections were poor because we were out in you know, rural Botswana having a wonderful time. And I started to get, when I got back to the lodge, I started to get text messages saying, have you heard what's happened? And I had the faintest idea what, what had happened. And then they got through to me the message that the Prime Minister had announced this prorogation. 
and the Supreme Court set a date. And fortunately, it was the end of my holiday. I arrived back at Heathrow Airport. You remember in the days when you could fly to different <laughs> countries? <laughs> it's in the, the past. I've arrived back at Heathrow Airport on the Monday morning. On the Thursday, we were in court. We were before the Lord Chief Justice and the Master of the Rolls and the President of the Queen's Bench Division. So it wasn't a normal case. I mean, it was done at enormous speed. And we lost in, in the High Court and then in the Supreme Court a couple of weeks later. That was how the case operates. It was all done in a concertina type of way. Right. Well, Joshua Rosenberg said, a quote from an article he wrote about you after Gina Mele says, how does he manage it? Referring to you. And he says, the first requirement is a detailed knowledge of all the leading cases. Any judge with the temerity to suggest that an earlier decision does not support the proposition panic is relying on will be steered politely but firmly in the right direction. But his main technique is to argue clearly and compellingly. He starts with what appears to be a truism. His second point follows entirely logically, and that in turn leads inexorably to a conclusion that the court is forced to adopt. Is that a fair description of how you approach your work? <laughs> As if. Uh, it's a very <laughs> flattering. Yeah, on, on a very good day, on a very very good day. That's what I'd like to think. But I'm afraid there are days when I go back to chambers and I have to confess that the Court of Appeal has just decided that uh, my submissions raise no arguable point of law, or as in one celebrated case where we won, we applied for costs, my costs, and the trial judge said, no, my client couldn't have my costs because they should bear in mind this is a court of law and not a casino. I mean, that was the <laughs> most, most damaging judicial comment. But, you know, I lose a lot of cases. And I, you tend to find, as you get more senior, you tend to find that the reason people come to you is because they're harder cases. And it's inevitable that you're not going to triumph on every occasion. So, I mean, I like to win. I get very upset, annoyed, frustrated, like everybody else, if I lose. But on a good day, with a strong wind behind me, with a, a, a sympathetic judge, well, yes, then Joshua is right. But it is not every day. Okay. <laughs> I wish. <laughs> yes. Okay. What do you enjoy most as a barrister after all these years? Well, I still enjoy the argument. I still enjoy the challenge. I still enjoy the uncertainty. It's much more difficult in the last year, of course, because cases are done remotely. And that, that's much harder, much less satisfying. I speak in a week in which earlier this week I appeared remotely in the court of final appeal in Hong Kong at 10 a.m. Hong Kong time, 2 a.m. London time. I was sitting here at my desk, dressed in my wig and gown as required to make submissions in the Hong Kong Court of Final Appeal. So it's still challenging. And I like the challenge. And when I cease to find it stimulating, entertaining, challenging, then I will retire. But at the moment, I'm carrying on. Great. Okay. Strange question, perhaps. But when you're listening to your opponent, what do you take a note of? Well, I think you're right to focus on listening because people often forget that a vital part of advocacy is not talking, it's listening. It's listening to what the other side is saying, it's listening to what the judge is saying, and that should inform your own submissions is absolutely a crucial part of advocacy. And that's forgotten by far too many advocates who are concentrating only on what they are saying. You know, I'm going to tell the judge. They're not listening to the judge and not listening to the other side. So, yeah, I mean, as the case continues, I, I make notes. I'm preparing what I'm going to say in response. If I'm the appellant, you know, I get another go.
If I'm the respondent, then I've got to listen to the appellant submissions so that I can respond. And it's a difficult part of advocacy because most cases you, you respond immediately. Uh, you don't get overnight to think about it. You've got to start. You've got to get on with it. And that's difficult, however well prepared you are. So listening is absolutely vital. Again, very mechanical question, but you used to draft your written submissions using shoulder notes where your references used to be on the side and a margin. I don't know whether you recall that. Well, what, my, my submissions? Well, it's certainly um, skeleton arguments. Yes, your uh, skeleton arguments. Sorry, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah. Well, or formal documents. I think they still are in the Supreme Court. You, you have side notes with, with the references. Right, okay, because that's standard practice now, having seen one of yours, that's pretty much standard practice in Malaysia now. Okay, quick fire round now. I know you've got to go. This will move very quickly. What do you enjoy most in practice, the intellectual exercise or the interpersonal skills? No, both, because they go together. I think you've got to do the intellectual exercise in order to be able to argue the case in court. The opponent you respected the most? Well, I've said already, I mean, Anthony Lester, Michael Beloff, Sidney Kentry. Okay. The judge who challenged you the most? Well, I've appeared before some great judges, Bingham, Hoffman, in Hong Kong, uh, Chief Justice Andrew Lee, Chief Justice Jeffrey Ma, there's so many great judges. Bingham was remarkable. I mean, Bingham would bring out the best in any advocate because he would be sympathetic but challenging. And he would always say, I remember it very well in the appellate committee at 1 p.m., however feeble the performance of the advocate, he would always say at one o'clock, Mr. So and so, we very much look forward to hearing your submissions again at two o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> very encouraging, very encouraging. What is the single most important quality in an advocate? Well, uh, hard work, determination, listening, all those qualities. What cases have you argued that stand out for you and why? Well, you've mentioned them already the Miller cases, the case in the European Court of Human Rights for the gay servicemen, Princess Diana. I mean, those are the most important cases, but there are many, many others, but those are the ones I would highlight. Could you describe a day in the life of David Panic QC? Not really. Every day is different. That's part of the fun of being a barrister. If you're in court, well, then your day is focused around being in court. That's all that matters. If you're preparing, well, then, you know, you're thinking, you're researching, you're preparing notes, you're advising clients, which is also very important. I spend much of my time advising clients not to litigate, not to go to court, resolve it. Not always successful. And what are your plans for the future? Well, as I said, to carry on. At the carry moment, on. I enjoy it. Carry on. No doubt some juniors, other QCs, judges, will tell me in due course. <laughs> no, I think we're way away from that yet. That's all I have. I don't know whether Ruslan's got anything else, but that has been a fascinating... I think we managed to get you for about an hour and 10 minutes, actually. Well, thank you for listening. I, mean, I mentioned the importance of listening. You have listened. And I'm very <laughs> grateful to you. I've enjoyed this trip down memory lane very much, so thank you for asking me. It's been a great, great pleasure. Thank you very much for being on. Thank you for listening to Advocates, the podcast. I hope you've enjoyed the program. Please follow us on all our social media channels. Leave a review or share this episode. And don't forget to tag us. We'd love to hear, your, to hear from you. Thanks. Listen to the voices of the advocate.